Just about everyone has had a moment in life where they look up at the sky and they say, God, are you up there? And even though that statement doesn't sound very confident, it is still a good example of what we call prayer. Well, how can we pray in a way that God will actually hear us? That's exactly what we're looking at in this video. Now, if this is one of the first One Church TO videos that you've checked out, we've actually got a free gift for you. You can find it in the Next Step links just outside this video window. So just before we hear from our teaching pastor, Keith, on how we can pray, let's let our music team share this song that talks about who we're praying to. Jesus Christ, 
Oh, his name is powerful. And by the end of our teaching time today, I want you to know this, that whether you're feeling his power or not, even if you're in that state of mind right now, your prayers are still powerful. We're, we're in a series, Whose Church Is This?, I received an email this past week from a whole family, and they said, Pastor Keith, during this pandemic, we decided to make One Church T.O. our church home. And uh, how do you think I responded? Do you think I said, oh, welcome, great to have you part of this church family in Toronto? Or, or did I say, oh, hold on here, you said it, it's your church? I've been here for over 25 years, and I've, I've contributed financially. I've, I've served this church. I've been one of its leaders on the pastoral staff. I, I'm a member here. What do you mean it's your church? It's, it's my church. How, how many think? No, no, because it doesn't matter how long I've been here or how much I have contributed or what position I have had in this church. It's still not my church. Now, hold on. Let's back up. We all know what someone means when they say, um, you know, that, that, that's one church to you is my church. And that is so admirable and so scriptural because it speaks of belonging and commitment. That's my church home. Pastor Jonathan is my lead pastor. I mean, that, that is so healthy and so right on scripturally. But whose church is it really? Is it the member's church, the pastor's church? Whose church is it, really? And uh, Pastor Jonathan started this series last weekend with this clarifying statement. He said, we don't have ownership rights. We do have custodial responsibilities. Then who does have the ownership rights? Well, you need to look no further than to the one and only one who um, started this church off in the first place. The, the one who died so his church could live forever. The one who put in place apostles, pastors, teachers to lead his church. The only one who is coming back for his church. How many of that? Any one of those criteria <laughs> narrows it down to just one person. And you hear his sense of ownership when he declares this and he says, I will build, do you know that one? <laughs> I will build my church and it'll be successful right to the gates of hell. I will build my church. It's Jesus' church and he, he, he leaves us not wondering who owns the church. Now, last weekend, Pastor Jonathan used this scripture from the first days of the church just to describe how, how beautiful and wonderful it was when they really understood they were Jesus people, all right? Uh, there were one church, Jerusalem, and here's how they're described. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. You know, these, these were the glory days of the church. If, if people are looking for, oh, when were the, the best days of the church? They'll often point to, to these scripture verses that describe it. The Acts church just grew from there so fast that the administration became so overwhelming that deacons rose up to take on that responsibility. When, when you lived in Jerusalem and you needed, you needed healing, you needed a prayer answered, you, you needed care, you needed teaching, the church was the go-to place in that city. They, they were the original, know God, love people, impact your city church. And, and it was, now, what, was it all, you know, silky smooth and easy peasy? No, no. But watch what happened when they faced persecution, they, they were, they, the jealous religious establishment tried to shut them down and said, don't meet anymore in the name of Jesus. Listen, the followers of Jesus, they knew whose church it was. And they immediately went to the owner and said, God, consider their threats. 
And then they went on to pray this. Stretch out your hand, Lord, with healing power. Doesn't sound like they're in retreat or on the defensive here. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant. It's your church, Lord. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They preached the word of God with boldness and all the believers were united in heart and mind. I mean, it was like a case of just ask and it is given by the Lord. It's just what a wonderful season this church is in. And so you'll hear people over the years and they'll say, you know, if we could just recreate that, that unity and that teaching reception and that the power and the, the miracles that they had at that time, if we could just recreate that today, basically they're saying, if only the church today could be like the church in Acts chapter two. And sometimes they get, you know, where's the miracles, the signs, the wonders, where's the power in the church today? And so let, let's look a little further at this Acts church. Let's move up to Acts chapter eight, where it says this, a great wave of persecution began that day. Notice that day, what happened that day that triggered it? We'll, we'll come back to that. And it, sw it was sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. The whole, because that's basically where the church was in Jerusalem. The, the persecution sweeps over the church in Jerusalem. All the believers except the apostles were scattered. Wow, what a, what a tragic turning point it would appear. All the believers were scattered throughout the regions and they go to Judea, that's a region. They go to Samaria, that was where some religious cultists lived. So you go to a region and to a people just all over the place. They're scattered. What is going on here? Listen, and by the time you get to chapter 12, it's like um, the persecution was like a, an Omicron wave. It was fast and it was widespread and, and, and it became so popular to persecute Christians that even the king got in on it. Look at this. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. He's beheaded. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, you know, the, the religionists, they, they, they felt that Christianity, this faith in Jesus was a, a threat to their traditional religious beliefs. And, and it pleased them. He also arrested Peter. And, and you can imagine when the news would spread to the believers that weren't scattered, there was still a remnant left in Jerusalem. The church was nothing what it used to be in Jerusalem, just a remnant of what it used to be. But how demoralizing. To hear, Peter's been arrested. Oh no, not Peter. Jesus said he'd be the rock. What are we going to do if anything ever happened to Peter? It had all been going so well and, and there was unity and thousands coming to Christ. They gathered in the temple courts with freedom, Acts early chapters say about the church. And then they get to this point where, where, where you know what happened? On that day, you know what happened on that day? Deacon Stephen was martyred for, for telling people about Jesus. And then the Jerusalem Christians were put in prison. It says that day, the person, they put them in prison. James is beheaded by Herod. Just read about that. Now it looks like it's Peter's turn next. He's been arrested. Well, look what happened to James. It'll likely happen to Peter now. Do you see it? By the time these remnant Christians in Jerusalem were hit with the news of Peter's arrest, they, they, they'd already been in a place where, where they were worn down. They were demoralized. You know, the good old days where thousands could gather in Jerusalem with freedom. Th those days are done. The big physical gatherings? Nah. Those days are done and dusted. The, the Acts Christians are, are a bit, aren't they? You can see the parallel? Like today's church going through a pandemic called COVID. Can't gather like we used to. Can't worship together and sense the presence of God together like we used to can't connect with other people and care for them like we used to. And this, this, you know, I don't know about you, but it's, it's when you're already down and then you get hit with more bad news. 
It's sort of like you parents that, you know, school's on again. No, it's off again. It's on again. It's off again. And, you're, you know, computers and technology and trying to get the attention of your kids and get them headspace. I mean, it's just business leaders on again, off again. It just, it's, it's when you're, you're already down and you get hit with more bad news. Um, I remember when my wife Esther and I were pastoring in the city of Edmonton and uh, our first child was born. It was an exciting time, except then we found out that, that our little baby David couldn't keep any food down. He had a severe reflux health issue. And... Um, and it just went on and on. He just he just wasn't getting nourished. He was getting lethargic and very weak and losing weight. And uh, and it, it, the doctor would just say, well, you know, try Similac, try Soilac. Some that have heard me tell this story before, there's a part that I've never told you before that I'm going to tell you next. But, but you know, I, I said, you know, we had him on Similac, Soilac, and every kind of lack that was on the market, and he was still lacking. He still wasn't being nursed, and, and it was a season in the church, and those that are watching from Edmonton, and I hear from you regularly, you might remember the church there, the Bloomer family brought their baby in that was not supposed to live, and the doctor said, there's nothing more we can do, take her home, but don't get attached, and you brought, they brought her by my office, and, and Jesus healed her completely. Another baby I was dedicating at that time, Jesus healed right then on the spot, and, and, and yet every night I would go home, and I would lay my hand on my little uh, firstborn child, David, and I would say, Jesus, heal David. Let him be nourished, Lord. Let him keep down this milk so that he can grow uh, physically. And, 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 and I'd say to Esther, when I come home, any change today? No, 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 maybe it's getting worse. And I, I'll never forget one time I went in and laid my hand on little my little baby and and said, Jesus, heal him. And uh, when, I, when I left, I had this voice in my mind that said, see, you can see other babies healed, <laughs> but you can't see it happen for your own. It just, it just wears you down. Uh, Peter was in prison, the Bible says, but the church, the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And then his trial, of course, gets delayed because of the Passover. So the church is just in torture. What's going to happen? What's the fate of Peter? Now, I think, don't you, that, come on, we're in the middle of a pandemic, Pastor Keith, and, and sort of sad news you're sharing here. I think it's about time we lightened up. So how about I tell you three humorous stories, all right? Um, and the third one's humorous, then it gets sad but then it gets happy again, all right? All right, here's the first one. Let me just read the first humorous story to you. It's Peter that's in prison, church is praying, and then an angel shows up in this maximum security prison. Peter is chained, and uh, okay, let me just read it. An angel struck Peter on the side. You know, a poker and nudge wasn't doing it. This dude was sound asleep. He struck him on the side. The chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. <laughs> but he stopped there. And then the angel says, wrap your cloak around you. <laughs> so, I mean, he's getting, here you're a grown man and he needs to be told how to get dressed and follow me. The, Peter followed him out of the prison, but listen to this. But he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision, all right? So he's, he's, he's three quarters asleep, not half asleep. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches. And then it goes on to say, listen, when this had dawned on him, <laughs> he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. So that's where some Christians that were still in Jerusalem had gathered at, uh, at, at John Mark's mom's house. And, and the, listen, here's an angel that supernaturally appears and Peter just sort of... Slow, it slowly dawns on him. But the second humorous story, watch this, is in Rhoda's response. She is the one that she hears, you know, she hears, here's a door, someone knocking at the door. She rushes to the door and then uh, she says, who is it? 
And, and he answers, Peter. <laughs> Listen to this now. Uh, let, let's look at it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, <laughs> she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. You, you just can picture it, can't you? She's just so excited. She leaves, you know, the star of the show outside in the cold where soldiers could find him, and she just rushes back in. She's so excited about this answer to prayer. Now, the third humorous story that turns out sad but then becomes happy is the church's reaction to the yes. All right? What's the, Peter's at the door. Guess what they say? You're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. Now, don't miss this. This is the, 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 the people at the prayer meeting gathered in a home. Why are they there? For one reason, to pray for Peter's release from prison. So you can hear them praying, Oh God, make a way where there seems to be no way. Do the impossible. Rhoder shows up and says, Peter's at the door. And they say, that's impossible. There's no way. And then... Rhoda, you're out of your mind. And then it goes on to say, when she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. Let's get back to praying. Let's not listen to Rhoda, but she insists it must be his angel. And this is where, this is where you see how sad is the state of these followers of Jesus. They're so demoralized now that they have more faith to believe that it's a supernatural angel at the door than it is to believe that exactly who they're praying for would ever be at the door. And meanwhile, of course, Peter continued knocking. <laughs> when they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. One translation says they were astonished. Why are they amazed and astonished? That he's the one that they were praying for, that he would be delivered from prison. What's going on here? And I, I thought about it. So understandable. These are the same people before they were scattered. Now they were weaker in numbers. And, but these are the same people that watched stones being thrown at Deacon Stephen when he was telling people about Jesus. You gotta know. You gotta know that they were praying and saying, Jesus, deliver Stephen out of this. this these are the same people who when James was arrested, were saying, oh God, we need this leader. Deliver James, Lord, from prison. Instead, Herod has uh, James beheaded. Friends and relatives, people they knew, flesh and blood of these people in this prayer meeting uh, are in prison. And they've been praying for their release, but they're still stuck in prison. It just keeps going on and on. It seems that no matter who they pray for or what they pray about, it just gets worse. The saddest part is that they've gotten to a place where they wonder, does God even hear us when we pray? And you can imagine the voices in their head, oh, for those glory days in, when we first met together in Jerusalem as a church and, and, and all of us could gather, thousands of us. And, and remember the time the place was shaken when we prayed in, in the face of persecution? Where's the miracles, the signs and the wonders today? It's so understandable, it's so easy to ask even for Christians in the middle of a pandemic in 2022, Jesus, do, do, do you hear us when we pray? Matter of fact, you know, so, uh, social media people, small re response to the survey, but very telling. They, they were asked the question, do you feel God hears you when you pray? And, and seven of the 19 said, no, we don't feel here. How do we get to a place where we, like those in the surveys, a number of them say, God doesn't hear us when we pray. Listen, you stay tuned. We need to watch what happens in Acts chapter 12 next, all right? But I'm gonna give you three truths that apply to those times where you pray and nothing happens and you just aren't feeling it, all right? Number one, when God doesn't answer yes to what you're asking, you can trust him to be doing something bigger and better than what you're asking for. 
I remember when we had uh, uh, our young adults group online and we had this discussion, we were trying to remember how Dr. Timothy Keller, a pastor in New York, said this. And the best we came up with was, God will always answer with exactly what you'd ask for if you knew all God knows. But actually, here's the way Timothy Keller said it. He said, if we knew what God knows, we would ask exactly for what he gives. Yeah. Now, what's this bigger and better that God wants to give? We ask for this, but he's got this bigger and better plan. How do you see it in Acts chapter 12? Well, all right, four quick questions for you. What was Jesus' big plan for his church? Long before Acts 2, church met and grew, Jesus had said this in Acts chapter 1. He said, you will be my, Acts chapter 2, you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem. Yeah, well, they certainly got that one. Then he says, throughout Judea, in other words, the regions beyond, in Samaria, even to people of other religious backgrounds that are stuck in religion and don't have a savior. So Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, right through to Toronto, Canada, <laughs> someday. So, so, so that, that's Jesus' big plan. All right, where were the believers stuck? Where were they staying? In Jerusalem. And, and they were going to Judea or Samaria. They, they were Jerusalem, you know, one church dot, Jerusalem. That's where they were. And, 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 and Jesus' bigger plan was that they would go to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. How did they get unstuck from Jerusalem and go to Judea and Samaria? All right, we're ready for Acts chapter 8, verse 1. A great wave of persecution began that day. Remember? We saw this verse. Stephen was killed, martyred, even though they were praying for him. And, and this persecution swept over the church in Jerusalem. Look at this. And all the believers, except the apostles, were scattered. But watch this. Through the regions of Judea, Samaria. And then the next verse gets exciting. Look at this. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. It just makes you wonder, what would have happened if they just stayed in Jerusalem? If there was no persecution, how many know God had a bigger and better plan so that more and more people would throw Judea and Samaria and right to the ends of the earth, including Toronto, will come to know the good news of his love and his grace and his everlasting life. But it works on a, on a personal basis as well. You know, Pastor Matt, did you know it's the name Smith? He's hosting online today. I came across a note that my son, Matthew, uh, I wrote it down. It came out of a conversation after, he, he was just 10 years old, nine or 10 years of age. We had just moved from Ottawa to Toronto. And, uh, you know, he, he's missing his friends and in new school, like so many of you just would identify just that transition ge geographically. And, and uh, he's missing his friends, missing life in Ottawa. One night early on after the move, he came into my bedroom and, and he said this. He said, I wrote it down. He says, Dad, here's $70 I've saved. I'll give you all of it if you'll just move us back to Ottawa. Was he honest? Yeah, it's what he was feeling at the time. Was he sincere? Absolutely. You know, what if I just said yes to that request? As a, as a loving father, I just said, yes, let's move back to Ottawa. What if I said yes to that heartfelt and sincere request? I was thinking of, um, of Matthew's amazing wife, Margaret. I, I can't imagine life without their two, two sons, uh, Reuben and Lavin. And then, and then I remember back, you know, where Matt got involved and grew spiritually in the, um, the youth ministry, the high schooler uh, ministry that we had here, and then was one of the leaders, really helped me get, start, get the young adults uh, started into a place where it began to thrive and reach more young adults. And uh, his contribution to music here over the decades and, 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 and leadership and uh, uh, pastoring and it just how, how many know what I'm saying? I think it's safe to say that God had bigger and better plans 
for Matthew Smith than what he was so honestly and sincerely asking for. So, so how do you pray so that God answers? Go ahead, pray your honest thoughts, but know that his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. When God doesn't answer yes to what you're asking, you can trust him to be doing something bigger and better than what you're asking for, okay? All right, secondly, we see this as well. Just because God didn't answer yes last time doesn't mean he's not going to answer yes next time. Because the, the, the early church, it was like, ask and receive. It was the only verse they needed to know from what Jesus said. The only phrase from that verse they needed to know. Ask and you receive. We love those days. You know, the unity, the miracles, the powerful prayers. But Jesus didn't just say, ask and receive. Watch this. He said, seek and you will find. Now, seek means you're not stationary. It means time goes by. You move from one place to another. You know, you say, Lord, what about this? And you, you, you move forward. You're seeking what God wants in terms of an answer to that prayer. Watch this. You get to a different place to receive the answer. Sometimes uh, God wants to ready you so you can handle the answer that he already wants to give. He did that for, for Joseph, didn't he? Remember Joseph, arrogant, sense of entitlement, God's hands on me, he's got dreams and plans. He, he needed to learn humility and closeness to God before he could get to a place where he could handle the position that God wanted him to have in Egypt so he could save the lives of many of his people. You, know, you see the same thing in Ruth. She needed to get into a, a place in the boundaries that God wanted her to live in as one of his people so that, so that he could bless her. And she ended up being the, what was a great, great grandma of King David and in the line of David, Jesus, the Messiah came. And, and speaking of David, you know, David, it, it was, remember running from Saul, learning to depend on God. Some of the best Psalms that help us through discouraging times were written during that time where David was running from Saul, and God's preparing David to be able to handle the kingship, and he does that with you. You, you seek sometimes. You seek, and you, you don't get there right away. It's not an ask and receive, but you seek, and you get to a place where you can handle the answer that God already wants to give, and then knock. What's the first thing you do when you knock? Ask Peter. <laughs> when Peter knocked on the door, he waited and waited and waited. Why? He was waiting until those other people were able to receive and believe that God would answer prayer. There are times where when we're praying for someone else or there's circumstances involved, listen, God wants to say yes, but we wait for his timing to bring about the conditions, the circumstances that are right for him. You know, there's nothing more powerful than an idea as time has come, and especially when it's God's idea. And, and, and he's preparing people to get to a place where they can handle what God wants to give. And so we knock and we wait for God's time. Listen to what the Apostle John wrote to Christians. He says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, and listen, you don't have God's will until you have God's timing. You get to a place where you're praying what God wants to have happen. And he, 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 he gets us to that place as we, as we seek and as we knock. He, he fashions and shapes. He changes what we pray for. A pray accordingly. Then he hears us. Did you hear me? <laughs> he hears you. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. How many during these years of pandemic have had the experience of, you know, on again, off again? Seems like, you know, the prayer's going to be answered. No, no. School, on again, off again. Work, on again, off again. Relationship, on again, off again. I, I don't know what's get, got you weary. I don't know what's wearing you down. One day I came home from work in Edmonton and Esther was, uh, was understandably crying and just holding her baby in that little living room of that townhouse we lived in. And uh, when I could finally get her to express beyond her, her, her emotions what she was going through, she said, I, I just talked to the doctor and he said, there's nothing more that he can do. And I wrote down the words, the doctor said, admit David to the hospital through emergency and we'll find out what the devil is going on. 
And right in that moment, however many times I prayed in the past, just something happened in my spirit. It wasn't feelings, it just faith just rose. Faith rose. And I said, Esther, we're going to pray for our baby David right now, and Jesus is going to heal him right now. And we prayed for him, and Jesus healed him. And that, that he never brought up any of the food that was put into him after that time. He was instantly healed. When Esther went for that regular checkup, they said he, he had gained so much weight, there must have been something wrong with what they recorded in the chart last time. Esther said, no, there's nothing wrong with the chart. What, what happened was we prayed and God healed our baby. And that's the reason for the weight, sudden weight gain. How many understand that just because God didn't answer yes last time does not mean that he's not going to answer yes the next time? Listen to me. Just because God did not answer something you were praying about in 2021 does not mean he's not going to answer it in this year of 2022. And just because God did not heal last time you prayed in that occasion, in that situation, does not mean that God's not going to heal in the next situation. Oh, our God we can trust him in the best time, fulfilling his highest purposes to answer our prayers with a yes when it is what's best. We, we, we can trust him for that. All right, and then third, and third, you find out how powerful prayer is when you keep trusting Jesus through a chapter where you're just not feeling it. <laughs> You know, I'm talking in a part of the building uh, where, you know, we, when we gather physically, it, it's, I've seen people out here in the lobby just praying for each other. And up there at the front of the church, we pray physically for each other. We know we can't do it, but how many don't? We don't have to be. The, the church is not where you go. The church is you who go. The church is not a place. It's always a people. Thank God for a building to meet in. But when we're feeling like this remnant and we're scattered, do you know what? We can still pray. Even when we're, even when we're worn down by a pandemic, we can still pray. Let me show you what happened. Listen, I, I think what I admire after this week's study so much about this Acts 12 church that gathered at John Mark's mother's house to pray, they were not feeling it. Come on now. Acts church power. God, miracles, advancement, success. No, they were not feeling it. They didn't even believe that when they prayed for Peter to be released from prison, that when he shows up at the door that it's really him. They're not believing that God is hearing what they're praying for. But they just kept trusting Jesus through this chapter, even though they were just not feeling it. I want to invite you to do that. Today, Pastor Matt's going to lead us in a prayer time in just a few moments. But listen, Acts 12 could have ended this way. It could have ended with Stephen and James killed, Peter in prison, Herod winning, and the church on the run. <laughs> but they prayed when they weren't feeling it. And you know what happened? You know how the chapter ends? Because they, they prayed and they weren't feeling it. The chapter that started with James being killed ends with James in heaven. Let's be real here. The chapter that began with Peter in maximum security ends with Peter free <laughs> to lead the church into new chapters. The chapter that began with Herod winning, you read on, it ends with Herod's death. The chapter that began with the church scattered ends with the church scattered bringing the good news to Judea, Samaria, and fulfilling God's plan to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth, even to you in Toronto or wherever you are watching from today. Listen, I, we want to pray for those that are in the middle of a chapter. I, I'm, I'm talking to medical workers who are so burned out, you feel you've got nothing left to give, but you want to help people. You need something supernatural of God's strength. I'm talking to parents. And, and business owners who are just so, so done with this pandemic and it's just again. I'm talking to people that whatever it is, it could be relationships, family and work, everything just seems to have an extra weight to it these days. And maybe you're just not feeling it. 
Well, I want to tell you that even when you're not feeling it, Jesus hears you and he is at work. Do not become weary in doing good. Doing what's right, scripture says, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. You see, do not give up in the middle of a chapter. Keep going until you see what God is going to bring out of this because he is going to bring good out of even our lousiest human experiences as we trust him and as we pray to him. Listen, you make sure as we move into this prayer time right now, you make sure whether you're feeling it or not, you just go ahead and pray and I'll tell you what's going to happen. Jesus will determine how this chapter in your life is going to end because this is his church and you are his child and he is going to bring about his will as you pray to him and entrust it to him. He's going to do something bigger and better than you can imagine. I hope you're able to step back into your everyday life feeling a lot better about talking to God. Knowing how he feels about you sure makes it easier to talk to him. Even if it's new for you, we hope you give it a try. Videos like this are just one part of an ongoing conversation. So we invite you, keep journeying with us. It's actually why we exist as a church, to help people know God, love people, and impact our city. If you want to know more about One Church TO, our team has put together some links to help you connect. You'll find these links to our next steps on this page just outside the video window. Feel free to share this video if you found it helpful. And for more teaching videos and other helpful content from One Church CO, hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching.